Hello and welcome to our lesson of week 13. This week we're going to start our final chapter. We're going to start talking about systems of linear differential equations. And we'll cover the first four sections of this chapter. This week we're going to be using some linear algebra. We hope you took my advice and you revised your linear algebra lecture notes or your or linear algebra book before this week's lesson. Let's suppose we have a dynamical system like this one in the picture. Suppose we have two masses and these are connected to each other and to two walls using three springs. I have an animated version of this picture. Let's suppose the masses are moving like this. How could we model this using differential equations? And how could we find x1 and x2, the positions or the displacements of the masses from their resting positions? I have, um, I have this image on the web at the address at the bottom if you want to open this in another tab. We'll come back to talking about this later. We're expecting that the acceleration of the blocks will depend on three things. It depends on the displacements, x1 and x2. It will depend on the forces on the blocks, and it will depend on the masses of the blocks. So we expect that the acceleration of the first block in other words, the second derivative of the first displacement will be some function of x1, x2, capital F1 and M1. And we expect that the acceleration of the second block, that's the second derivative of the displacement x2, should also be a function of four things, x1, x2, F2 and M2. We, we're expecting that we're going to have a system of two differential equations. To be able to solve this, to be able to find x1 and x2, we're going to need to solve these equations at the same time. It's not possible to solve one differential equation first and then move on to the second one. We're going to need to solve them at the same time. Another system of differential equations, perhaps the most famous system of differential equations, is the predator-prey equations, which originate around about 1925. In this system, x is the number of prey and y is the number of predators. For example, x could be the number of mice in an area and y could be the number of owls in an area. If you remember back to the first lesson of this course, we looked at a simple model for mice and owls. This is a more sophisticated model because in this model, we're allowing the number of owls to change. If there's lots of mice, that means there's lots of food for the owls to eat, we would expect the number of owls to increase. However, if there's not enough mice to feed the owls, then the number of owls should decrease. You will note that these equations both include an xy term. These equations are non-linear equations. In this course, we're going to be studying systems of linear equations. So the predator-prey equations are beyond the scope of this course. It's possible to convert an nth order linear ordinary differential equation into a system of n first order linear differential equations. Or vice versa, if we started with a system of n first order linear differential equations, we could convert this into one nth order linear differential equation. I'm going to show you an example of this. On your homework, homework nine, you have a question that's similar to this example. Write this second order differential equation as a system of two first order ordinary differential equations. 
we need to introduce two variables, x1 and x2. I'm going to let x1 be equal to u. That's the variable that we started with. And then x1, x, sorry, then x2, I'm going to be let it to be the derivative of u. This is a sensible way to start this question. Let x1 be u, let x2 be u prime. If we had a third order equation, we would let x3 be u double prime. If we had a fourth order equation, we would introduce x4 is u triple prime, and so on. We have a second order equation, so we're having x1 and x2. Then, clearly, the derivative of x1, which is the derivative of u, is the same as x2. We also need the derivative of x2. x2 is the derivative, so x2 prime is the derivative of u prime or u double prime. From the differential equation that we started with, we could rearrange this to u double prime is equal to minus 0.25 u prime minus u. And then substitute in x1 and x2, we get minus 0.25 x2 minus x1. And that's all we need to do. Then we have the system. x1 prime is x2, x2 prime is minus x1 minus 0.25 x2. And by convention, we do x1 first and x2 second. It doesn't really matter, but uh, this is the usual way to write it. As I said, you have a homework question which is similar to this example. We're going to be using some linear algebra today. We're going to be using matrices, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We're going to be using the Ronskian, the ideas of linear in independence, and more topics from linear algebra. So please revise your linear algebra lecture notes or read your linear algebra textbook. Or if you have the differential equations book by Boyce and Prima, they give a nice overview of the linear algebra that we need in section 7.2 and section 7.3. Let's start talking about the basic theory of systems of first order linear equations. This is a system of linear differential equations. It's n differential equations in n variables. And typically these are going to be the same number. We have two equations, the two variables, three equations, three variables, four equations, four variables, etc. Typically these are going to be the same. Clearly, this is a complicated way to write this. But we know from our linear algebra course, there's an easier way to write systems of equations. We could use matrices. If x is the vector x1 up to xn, and then x prime is the vector x1 prime, x2 prime, etc. If P was this coefficient matrix, and if G was G1, G2 up to Gn, then the system on the previous page can just be written in the nice, easy way. X prime is equal to P of T, X plus G of T. For vectors, I'm using bold font. For numbers, I'm using non-bold font. If I was using a pen, I would use underlined. I would write x underlined prime, just here, g underlined, etc. First, let's suppose we're not going to worry about g. Let's suppose first we're going to look at the homogeneous system. x prime is equal to p of t x. In chapter three and chapter, yeah, chapter three, there's a mistake here. When we wanted multiple solutions to a differential equation, 
we will try y1, y2, y3, etc. etc. But this is going to be confusing in this section because we're already using x1, x2 to denote the coordinates. X bold font or x underlined using a pad was the vector with coordinates x1, x2, etc. So we need a new way to, to write down different solutions to a differential equation. And the notation that I'm going to use is I'm going to use superscript and then a number in brackets. Now, just to be clear, this does not mean two derivatives of x. This just means solution number two. You also recall from chapter three, when we looked at second and higher order equations, that if y1 and y2 are both solutions to a linear differential equation, then every linear combination of them is also a solution. We have the same property for linear systems. If we know that x1 and x2 are both solutions to our system of linear differential equations, then every linear combination of x1 and x2 is also a solution. For example, here is a differential, here is a system of first order differential equations. x prime is equal to the matrix 1141 multiplied by x. And I'm saying that two solutions to this differential equation are the vector 1, 2 multiplied by e to the power 3 t and the vector 1 minus 2 e to the power minus t. I'm saying that these are both solutions to this differential equation and I'm going to show you that this is true later. That means every linear combination of these two functions is also a solution to this system. In other words, C1, 1, 2, e to the power of 3t, plus C2, 1 to minus 2, e to the minus t, is a solution to the system for any constants C1 and C2. Same ideas that we did before, same ideas as from chapter 3. Unless I say otherwise, please assume that Pt is an n by n. Let's suppose we have n solutions, and let's suppose that these solutions are linearly independent. Then we have a theorem that says every solution to the system can be written as a linear combination of these n functions in exactly one way. Again, same ideas that we looked at as in chapter three. If this, if in this case, if we have n solutions to an, a linear system of n equations in, and if these solutions are linearly independent, then we say that they form a fundamental set of solutions to the linear system. And we say that a linear combination of these functions is the general solution to our linear system. Again, same ideas that we developed in chapter three, we're just we're going to be reusing these ideas. Section 5.3 is titled Homogeneous Linear Systems with Constant Coefficients. Now we're going to be looking at the linear system x prime is equal to ax, where now a is a square n by n constant matrix. It's a matrix where each of the numbers is a real number. If n is equal to 1, then we just have 
one first order linear equation with one variable in. In other words, we have something like dx dt is equal to ax. And we don't have to solve this. We know that the solution to this equation is ce to the power 80. That's a number multiplied by an exponential function. Maybe it's always something multiplied by an exponential function. Let's make a guess. Let's guess that if n is greater than 1, we still have the solution something, instead of a number, a vector, multiplied by an exponential function. For some number r, which we don't know, and some vector xi, which we don't know. This symbol is the Greek letter xi. How could we find the number r? How can we find the vector xi? Let's test our guess. We want xi e to the power rt to solve differential equation x prime is equal to ax. I'm going to substitute this in. Instead of x, I'm going to write xi e to the rt. The derivative is xi e to the rt. Xi is a constant vector. We don't need to differentiate that. The derivative e to the rt is r e to the rt. So we get r xi e to the rt. And we can also put this instead of the x in, on the right. So we get a xi e to the power rt. Both sides of this equation include e to the rt. We can cancel these out. And we would be left with r xi is equal to a xi. Or rearrange this, move everything to the left. We could write this as a minus ri xi is equal to 0, where i is the identity matrix. Now, wait a minute. This looks familiar. Everybody that studied linear algebra immediately recognizes this equation. This is the equation for an eigenvalue and an eigenvector. So R must be an eigenvalue of the matrix A, and xi must be a corresponding eigenvector. So the idea is, to solve an equation, we're going to be finding the eigenvalues, we're going to be finding the eigenvectors, and then our solution is going to be eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t. Solve x prime is equal to 1141x. This is the one I gave you earlier. I already told you, this, the, told you two solutions to this. Let's see if we can find how to do it. First thing we need to do is we need to find the eigenvalues. This should be revision for you. This should be straightforward to you because you've studied linear algebra. But I'll go through it quickly. To find eigenvalues, we always start with the equation, the determinant a minus ri is equal to 0. Or you may be familiar with swapping a and ri around. You might want to start with the determinant of ri minus a is equal to 0. These are, of course, the same because if we swap the positions of a and ri, we either multiply by minus 1 or we multiply by 1. But 0 multiplied by 1 is 0. 0 multiplied by minus 1 is also 0. You could use whichever one of these you want to use. That's 1 minus r, 1 for 1 minus r. Calculate this determinant, r minus r squared minus 4. Multiply this out and then factorize, we get r plus 1 multiplied by r minus 3. 
So the eigenvalues of this matrix are 3 and minus 1. Next, we need to find the eigenvectors. And we need to find an eigenvector for each eigenvalue. First, I'm going to look at the eigenvalue R1 is equal to 3. To find an eigenvector, we start with the equation A minus R1i multiplied by xi is equal to 0. R1 is equal to 3. That's the same as saying minus 2, 1, 4 minus 2, xi 1, xi 2. And because we should always have the first line and the second line given the same equation. Quickly go check it. Both the first line and the second line of the matrix give us the equation 0 is equal to minus 2 psi 1 plus psi 2. We can choose any vector which satisfies this equation. I like simple numbers, so I'm going to choose 1 for, for, the, for psi 1. And then to satisfy the equation, the second number must be 2. I'm going to use the eigenvector 1, 2. But of course, there are many, many correct answers here. Then we must do the same thing for the second eigenvalue. If R2 is minus 1, then we attain 0 vector is equal to 2, 1, 4, 2, xi 1, xi 2 which implies that 0 is equal to 2 xi1 plus xi2. Again, we can choose any vector which satisfies this equation. I like simple numbers, so I'm going to choose xi1 is equal to 1, and then xi2 must be minus 2. So I'm going to choose the eigenvector 1 minus 2. After this, we're ready to write down our two solutions. We have eigenvector, e to the power eigenvalue t, and again, eigenvector, e to the power eigenvalue t. These are our two solutions to the differential equation. But are these two solutions linearly independent? To find out, we need to calculate the Ronskin of these two functions. Let me rearrange the two functions first of all. When I calculate the Ronskin, I don't want vector multiplied by exponential function, I just want vector. So the first function I'm going to be writing is e to the 3t, 2e to the 3t. And the second function I'm going to be writing is e to the power minus t, minus 2e to the power minus t. The run screen is the determinant of the matrix where the first column is x1 and the second column is x2. When we calculate the run screen of these two functions, we get minus 4 e to the power 2t, which is never equal to 0. Because the run screen is not equal to 0, these two functions are linearly independent. We have two solutions, two linearly independent solutions. So we have a fundamental set of solutions. Then we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. The general solution is constant, first function, plus constant, second function. Let's do another example. We might have an initial value problem. Solve x prime is equal to 8 minus 1, 6, 1, x with the initial condition x at 0 is equal to 1 minus 2. The technique is the same. First, we need to find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. 
as soon as we know the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, we can write down the general solution. And then we need to choose the constant C1 and C2 to satisfy the initial condition. I'm not going to be calculating the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors each time. I'm going to leave that for you to check. From now on, in almost every example, I'm just going to be telling you the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And I'm relying on this being something that you know how to do. The eigenvalues of this matrix are 7 and 2. The corresponding eigenvectors we could choose are 1, 1 and 1, 6. As soon as we know the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. Constant C1, 1, 1 e to the power 70, plus constant C2, 1, 6 e to the power 2t. All that's left is to choose the constants C1 and C2. I've written our general solution at the top. We're going to set t equal to 0, and we need to satisfy that x of 0 is equal to 1 minus 2. Setting t equal to 0, the ex exponential functions will just disappear because e to the power of 0 is 1. And we obtain c1 plus c2, c1 plus 6, c2. So C1 plus C2 must be equal to 1, and C1 plus 6, C2 must be equal to minus 2. This is a system of two linear equations. You know how to solve this. We studied this in linear algebra. So I'll just tell you the answer. The answer is that C1 must be 8 over 5, and C2 must be minus 3 over 5. And then we're ready to write down the answer to this problem. The answer to this problem, the solution to the initial value problem, is 8 over 5, 1, 1, e to the power 70, minus 3 over 5, 1, 6, e to the power 2, 2. When we choose eigenvectors, there are infinitely many correct answers. So that means there are infinitely many different ways to write down a general solution. But when we solve an initial value problem, once you've found the constants, that will remove the, the, um, the choices. You'll always get the same solution to an initial value problem. Another example, solve x prime is equal to minus 3, root 2, root 2, minus 2x. In other words, find the general solution to this linear system. I'll just tell you the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are minus 1 and minus 4. The eigenvectors are 1 root 2 and minus root 2. And this is all we need to, to calculate. As soon as we know these, we can write down the general solution to this linear system of first order differential equations. It must be C1, <coughs> eigenvector e to the power eigenvalue t plus C2, eigenvector e to the power eigenvalue t. That's all we need to do here. Now, when we're calculating eigenvalues of a matrix, you will recall from linear algebra that there are three possibilities. Possibility one, we might have that all of the eigenvalues are real numbers and they're all different. 
Possibility two is that the eigenvalues might occur in complex conjugate pairs. Or possibility number three, we might have some repeated eigenvalues. But you're going to need to look at these situations, these possibilities separately. At the moment, we're talking about possibility one. What, we, what do we do if all of the eigenvalues are real and different? In the final section of today's lesson, we're going to be talking about complex conjugate pairs of eigenvalues. And next week, we will cover the possibility of repeated eigenvalues. A fact from linear algebra, all of the eigenvalues are real and different then the eigenvectors are all linearly independent. Because the eigenvectors are linearly independent, that means the Ronskin of our solutions must be non-zero. In other words, our n solutions must form a fundamental set of solutions. If you have real different eigenvalues, then we don't need to worry about if our solutions are linearly independent because we know from linear algebra that they must always be linearly independent. They must always give us a fundamental set of solutions. If some eigenvalues are repeated, then we might have linearly independent eigenvectors, or we might not have linearly independent eigenvectors. If we do have linearly independent eigenvectors, then this is still true. The solutions, using us, using the way of writing down them as eigen vector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t form a fundamental set of solutions. Let me show you that using this example. Solve x prime is equal to 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, x. And I'm just going to tell you the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Here they are. I trust that you could calculate these yourself. The eigenvalues, we have 2, minus 1, and then minus 1 is repeated. For R1 equal to 2, we have the eigenvector 1, 1. The eigenspace is one-dimensional. If the eigenvalue is minus 1, then the eigenspace is actually two-dimensional. In other words, we could find two linearly independent eigenvectors. In this situation, the three eigenvectors that we have are linearly independent. That means that the three solutions that we have will form a fundamental set of solutions. I'm going to leave it for you to check that the Ronskin of these three functions is non-zero. As soon as we have three linearly independent solutions, we can write down the solution to the differential equation. If we have linearly independent eigenvectors, it doesn't matter if some of the eigenvalues are repeated. In the final section of today's lesson, we're going to be studying systems with complex eigenvalues. And you will notice that we've done three sections already, but only 36 slides. There's still lots of slides remaining just about complex eigenvalues. As before, we're going to consider an 
the system x prime is equal to ax, where a is an n by n square matrix of real numbers. Just to remind you, when I write x prime is equal to ax, x prime means the vector x1 prime, x2 prime, etc. x means the vector x1, x2 up to xn. And A means the square matrix of numbers, something like this. Or this also means the system of n first order differential equations in n variables. x1 prime is a number x1 plus a number x2 plus dot 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 plus a number xn, etc. Because this is a messy way to write it, we're just writing this as x prime is equal to ax. Now, any complex eigenvalues of a must occur in complex conjugate pairs. In other words, if lambda plus i mu is an eigenvalue of a, then its complex conjugate, lambda minus i mu, is also an eigenvalue. Something else we know from linear algebra is that if xi1 is an eigenvector corresponding to r1, then its complex conjugate is an eigenvector corresponding to r2. So if we know our eigenvalue of eigenvector, then we know two solutions. We know xi1 e to the power r1t and complex conjugate of xi1 e to the power complex conjugate of r1t. But these two functions map from the real numbers to cn. And we don't want to be mapping to cn. We want solutions which map to rn. Recall what we did in chapter three. I'm going to use the same ideas here. Let's suppose that lambda, the R1 is lambda plus I mu, and let's suppose that xi1 is A plus IB, where lambda and mu are real numbers, A and B are real vectors. Then our first solution, xi1 e to the power r1t, we can write as a plus ib e to the power lambda plus i mu t. We know how to deal with e to the power of a complex number. We can use Euler's formula to write this as e to the lambda t cos mu t plus i psi mu t. I want to multiply this out rearrange to gather all of the real terms first and all of the imaginary terms together. For the real terms we have a multiplied by cos and we also have ib multiplied by i sine because i squared is equal to minus one. For the imaginary terms we have a multiplied by i sine, and we have ib multiplied by cos. Or we have some function u plus i multiplied by some function v. Note that u and v both map from the real numbers that are these two functions will be linearly independent. And furthermore, the span of these two functions will be the same as the span of x1 and x2. This means that when we write down our fundamental set of solutions, instead of including x1 and x2, we can use u and v. For example, solve x prime is equal to minus a half one minus one minus a half x. We need the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So let's calculate them. 
As always, to find eigenvalues, we start with determinant of a minus r i is equal to zero. And in this case, that gives us r squared plus r plus five over four. The solutions of this equation are minus a half plus or minus i. So our two eigenvalues are minus a half plus i and minus a half minus i. We're going to use r1. We don't need r2. Let's use r1. We need to calculate an eigenvector. To calculate an eigenvector, we always start with a minus r1i is i1 is equal to 0. And that tells us that we must have minus i xi1 plus xi2 is equal to 0 from the first line. And from the second line, we must have minus xi1 minus i xi2 is equal to 0. There are not two different equations here. There's only one equation here. If we take the first equation, and if we multiply this by i, the first term becomes minus i multiplied by i. i squared is minus 1. So instead, let's multiply by um, minus i. Minus i multiplied by minus i, and the minuses cancel out to be plus. We have i squared, which is minus 1. That just gives us minus. And then xi2 multiplied by minus i is just minus i xi2. In fact, this is the same equation. Second line is just a constant multiplied by the first equation. That means we could use whichever one of these we wanted. Let's say we use the first one. We can use any vector which satisfies this equation. Again, I like easy numbers, so I'm going to choose one of these to be number one. I'm going to choose that xi1 is the number one. And then to satisfy this equation, xi2 must be i. So I'm going to use the eigenvector 1i. Now, note that xi2 is the complex conjugate of xi1. That's the complex conjugate of the vector 1i. Complex conjugate of 1 is just 1. The complex conjugate of i is minus i. So xi2 must be 1 minus i. But we don't need this. We don't need xi2. We're only going to be using r1 and xi1. So forget about this. We don't need this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at first function x1. Here we are, x1 is xi1 e to the power r1t. For us, that is now the vector 1i multiplied by e to the power minus t over 2, cos t plus i sine t. We need to rearrange this so we have real valued function plus i multiplied by real valued function. So leave the e to the power minus t over 2 outside for now. In the first position we have cos t plus i sine t, and the second position is i cos t minus sine t. What are the real terms? The real terms is cos and minus sine. The imaginary terms are sine t and cos t. So we could write it like this e to the power minus t over 2, cos t minus sine t, plus i, e to the power minus t over 2, sine t, cos t. And this is the two functions that we want. This is u of t and v of t. So we're going to be using the functions u of t is e to the power minus t over 2, cos t minus sine t, 
and v of t is e to the power minus t over 2 sine t cos t. I said that these functions should always be linearly independent. Is that true? Let's check it. To ask, answer the question, are they linearly independent, we calculate the run stream. And we find that the run stream is not equal to zero. So the answer is yes. That means u and v form a fundamental set of solutions. And we can write down the general solution to the differential equation, so the system of first order linear differential equations, as a linear combination of u and v. The answer to this problem is c1 e to the power minus t over 2 cos t minus sine t plus c2 e to the power minus t over 2 sine t cos t. Let's recap our method. Our method is this. We need to find the eigenvalues and we need to find eigenvectors. If the eigenvalue is real, then the solution that we want to use is eigenvector e to the power eigenvalue t. If the eigenvalue is complex, then we want to write out solution as a real valued function plus i times a real valued function. And then instead of using x, we use these two functions, this green function and this orange function. The next example is an example from electrical engineering. We're going to be using this simple circuit with two resistors, an inductor and a capacitor. This electric circuit is described by this linear system. I here is the current through the inductor and V is the voltage drop, drop across the capacitor. And the circuit is described by I prime is equal to minus I minus V. V prime is two I minus V. Why is this true? Why does this, differential, this system of differential equations describe this circuit? I'm not going to go into that, I'm just going to say, ask an electrical engineer why this is true. This is a maths course, we're just going to look at the maths of solving this linear system. Suppose that time t equal to zero, the current is two amps, and the voltage drop is two volts. Find the current as a function of t and find the voltage as a function of t. I've written the problem at the top in grey. Let's change this into matrices. We need to solve the initial value problem. The derivative IV is minus 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1. That's the numbers here. Minus 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1. Multiplied by IV with the initial condition. I at time 0 is 2 amps. V at time 0 is 2 volts. We need the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. I'm just going to tell you that the eigenvalues are minus 1 plus or minus i root 2. Please check that's true. And I'm just going to tell you that the corresponding eigenvectors are 1 minus i root 2 and 1 i root 2. Now remember, we don't need to use both of these. We only need one of them. We're only going to use r1. So forget about R2, we don't need this. Forget about Xi2, we don't need this. We're just going to use R1 and Xi1. And we're going to calculate X1. That's 
eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t. When we put this, these numbers in and rearrange, we find that we have a green function, e to the power minus t, cos root 2t, root 2 sine root 2t, plus i multiplied by an orange function, e to the power minus t, sine root 2t, minus root 2, cos root 2t. And I leave this for you to check when you have more time. As soon as we know these two functions, as soon as we know the green function and the orange function, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. It's always constant green function plus constant orange function. To finish solving this problem, we need to find the constant C1 and C2, which satisfy the initial condition. We need I of 0 is 2 and V of 0 is 2. This is actually quite, this is easy to solve straight away. We can see that we must have C1 is 2 and C2 is minus root 2. So we can write down the answer to this problem. 2 e to the power minus t, cos root 2t, root 2 sine root 2t, minus root 2, e to the power minus t, sine root 2t, minus root 2, cos root 2t. But the question wasn't about matrices, the question was about functions. The question started with i and v. So we should give our answer in the same form as the question. The answer to this problem is a function i and a function v. i, that's the top line, 2 e to the power minus t, cos root 2 t, minus root 2 e to the minus t, sine root 2 t. And for v t, we look at the bottom. 2 e to the power minus t, root 2 sine root 2 t, minus root 2 e to the power minus t, multiplied by minus root 2 cos root 2 t. Now let's look at the dynamical system which I referred to at the start. Suppose we have our two masses which are moving left and right, two masses connected together with to each other and to the walls with three springs. I want to model this system. I suppose our masses have mass two kilograms and nine over four kilograms. Let's suppose our springs have spring constants, one newton per meter, three newtons per meter, and 15 over four newtons per meter. Let's suppose that the base position, that's when x1 and x2 are zero, is shown at the top. And then let's suppose we measure the position of the masses as in how far to the right they move. For the dynamical system shown on the previous slide, find x1 as a function of t and x2 as a function of t. As the springs are stretched and compressed, they're going to apply blocks, apply forces on the blocks as shown here. I'm using Hooke's law from physics. First of all, let's look at the left strip. When the blo left block moves to the right, 
the left spring stretches and then wants to pull the block back to the left. The, string, the spring is stretched by x1 and the spring constant is 1. So the force which from the left spring pulling on the left block should be 1x1. Next, I want to look at the effect of the middle spring on the left block. How it, what is the, how much does the middle spring stretch? It stretches by x2 minus x1. And the spring constant is 3. So the spring is going to be pulling to the right with a force of 3 multiplied by x2 minus x1. Likewise, this spring is going to pull the right block to the left with a force of 3x2 minus x1. That's the spring constant of 3 multiplied by how much the spring stretches. And then finally, the right hand spring. I'm imagining that the right hand block is moving to the right. So the right hand spring is being squashed. Because it's been squashed, it wants, it wants to push to the left. So the force is going to be pointing to the left. And the force is going to be the spring constant, 15 over 4, multiplied by how much the spring is squashed, which is x2. Now, we know mass times acceleration is equal to force. Let's look at the left block first of all. The mass of the block is 2, and the acceleration of the blo left block is d squared x1 dt squared. The force acting on the left block, remembering that to the right is the positive direction, we have 1x1 pointing to the left, but because of Going to the right is the positive direction. We need to write this as a minus sign. And then we have 3x2 minus 1 pointing in the positive direction. So plus 3x2 minus x1. And we could do the same thing for the right-hand block. The mass is 9 over 4 multiplied by the acceleration d squared x2 dt squared must be equal to the sum of the forces because the forces are all pointing to the left. Both, all of the forces are minus forces, minus 3x2 minus x1, minus 15 over 4x2. These are our two differential equations. This is a system of two second order ordinary differential equations. But we haven't been studying systems of second order equations, we've been studying systems of first order equations. Then back to how I started in the introduction, I showed how we can convert a second order equation into a system of two first order equations. We're going to do that again here. We want a system of first order differential equations. So I'm going to introduce new variables, y1 up to y4. Y1, I'm going to call x1. Y2, I'm going to call x2. Y3, I'm going to be x1 prime. And Y4 is going to be x2 prime. Then, Y1 prime, that's x1 prime, is the same as Y3. Y2 prime, or x2 prime, is the same as Y3. Four. Y3 prime or X1 double prime. Look at the first equation. 
that must be a half minus x1 plus 3x2 minus 3x1. Or in terms of y1 and y2, that's minus 2y1 plus 3 over 2y2. And we can do the same for y4 prime. Using the second equation at the top, we can find that that must be the same as 4 over 3 y1 minus 3 y2. We can write this in terms of matrices. We have the linear system, y prime is equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 2, 3 over 2, 0, 0, 4 over 3, minus 3, 0, 0, y. This is a system of four first order linear differential equations in four variables. And we know how to solve this. First, we need the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. I'm going to tell you that the characteristic polynomial of this matrix is r4 plus 5r squared plus 4. Please check this, which we could write as x squared plus 1, so r squared plus 1, r squared plus 4. So the eigenvalues are i, minus i, 2i, and minus 2i. We don't need to use all of these, but we have two pairs. And in each pair, we only need to use one eigenvalue. So we can cross two of these out. We're not going to use R2, and we're not going to use R4. We're going to use the eigenvalues I and 2i. We need eigenvectors. I'm just going to tell you the answer. Please check that corresponding eigenvectors are 3, 2, 3, i, 2, i, and 3 minus 4, 6, i, minus 8, i. First, we'll look at the first solution, x1. That's xi1 e to the power r1 t. We can write this as a green function plus i multiplied by an orange function. We have two real valued functions, which I'm going to call u and v. And then we do the same thing for r3. We can write this as real valued function plus i real valued function. I've already used u and v, so I need new letters. I'm going to use w and z. We have four real valued functions, u, v, w, and z. And these are the functions that we use to write down the general solution. The general solution must be a linear combination of these four functions. This is the general solution to this problem. I suppose we look at an initial value problem for this dynamical system. I suppose, again, we have the, the problem with the moving blocks, but let's suppose that now we have the initial condition, y of 0 is minus 1, 4, 1, 1. And we're asked to sketch the graphs of y1 and y2. In other words, sketch the graphs of the displacements x1 and x2. We need to solve this initial value problem. Y prime is this matrix multiplied by y with the initial condition y of 0 is minus 1, 4, 1, 1. And I'll just tell you the solution. Please check, please check that these constants are correct. Check that the constants are 4 over 9, 7 over 8, minus 7 over 9, and minus 1 over 36. Now that we have this, we can use a computer to draw the graphs of this function. This is a graph of y1, which is the same as x1. This is 
the displacement of the left block. And we can also draw the displacement of the right block. And these are the formulae that I used when I calculated, when I generated my moving, when I generated my animation. Just using the formulae from the previous slide, I programmed this picture to just move the block using this combination of sines and cosines and move the right block in terms of the, using this combination of sines and cosines. And that is the end of this week's lesson. This animation, you can find this web address or I've li linked it in the content, um, the course material section. That is the end of this week's lesson. Next week, we'll talk about fundamental matrices and we'll talk about repeated eigenvalues. It's not just repeated eigenvalues, it's repeated eigenvalues where we do not have n linearly independent eigenvectors. So really, we, we might think of the section title as repeated eigenvalues without n linearly independent eigenvectors. Are there any questions?